Good morning. Look at this room. This is a full room. We were here a year ago, and there weren't this many people here. This is fantastic. I'm so glad to see you here. Well, I'd like to welcome the co-creator of Apache Kafka, the co-founder of Confluent, Neha Narkiti. Oh my God, London, welcome to Kafka Summit. Isn't it quite amazing that just at the second London Summit, we have over a thousand people in attendance. I'm really excited that the London Summit is where I'm getting a chance to speak about our cloud journey and some exciting updates about Confluent Cloud. So let's get started. You know, as part of my job, every day I get to experience um, a new business reality. And the contrast with how businesses used to work is really quite stark. For instance, you know, in the past, enterprises would think of technology as a support function. The CIO was thought of as a technical leader. But today, technology is the business. The CIO is a business leader. Every day, I get to see major banks that see themselves as software companies that just happen to deal with money. Major retailers see themselves as data companies that just happen to sell shoes. You know, in the past, Innovation was sort of thought of as a growth investment, something that was optional. But today, innovation is pretty much core to survival. If enterprises don't reinvent themselves through technology, they might lose. In fact, I was looking at some estimates that over the last five years, over 185 retailers have downsized or even shut down in the UK, leading uh, to the closure of over 7,000 stores. You know, in the past also, um, running the business on yesterday's data was thought of as, you know, good enough. But today, running the business on yesterday's data is pretty much a path to failure. Companies need real-time modern data infrastructure. And this need for modern real-time data infrastructure is really, I think, the impetus behind event streaming. Some of you might know that Apache Kafka and event streaming was born at LinkedIn back in 2010. Since then, it spread rapidly within and beyond Silicon Valley to today, where roughly about 60% you know, of Fortune 100 uses it as a fundamental technology platform. Even today, the new companies that get created, the digital ones, use it as a basis for their business. And here's what all of us are building with event streaming. These are some of my favorite applications that have been shared by community members at various Kafka summits and beyond, from banking assistance, publishing pipelines, all the way to online dating. The impact of event streaming spans all kinds of industries, from startups to the biggest established companies. And across each of those event streaming applications, there is a common thread. And there's one central challenge, which is connecting your applications with data. If you remember, in the past, we had roughly two ways to do this. We had ETL tools that tracked what has happened in the world. And we had messaging systems that helped us track what is happening in the world. And we had these two ways of connecting applications with data, and we applied it to a brand new environment. And this is how it plays out, right? You have ETL tools that uh, connect your data systems, primarily databases, data warehouses. Uh, you have then your messaging systems. You introduce it to connect your applications in real time to track what is happening. Then you want to connect across lines of businesses so you can build meaningful applications, so you introduce more connections. And uh, nowadays, you want to adopt the public cloud, so you end up with even more connections. Ultimately, this is what every enterprise data infrastructure looks like when we talk to them. And this is the ultimate visual representation of what it means to be restricted by infrastructure rather than being enabled by it. But then how did we get here? You know, it's because of trade-offs that were introduced by the technologies that existed back then, right? If you think about this, the ETL and data integration model allowed you to move large amounts of stored data at high throughput. It is durable, it's persistent, it's ordered. But it also meant doing batch processing, which is expensive and time-consuming. 
So you have that on one hand. On the other hand, we had messaging systems, and they're meant for communicating in real time between applications, so it's obviously fast and low latency, but then it's sometimes hard to scale for high throughput use cases. And most importantly, there is no persistence. So after consumption, there is no way to go back and replay to fix things. So both of these models have their inherent upsides and downsides, but the situation is actually far worse. As you've seen, we've built a whole maze, but we still haven't solved the core problem, which is how do you build these real-time data-driven applications you know, that could span the whole organization, that could break infrastructure and various organization boundaries? You know, the answer is in event streaming. The event streaming paradigm, what it does is it takes the strengths of both of these two very different ways of handling data, and it builds from the grounds up a modern technology platform. One that is highly scalable, it's durable, it's persistent, ordered, it's also fast and low latency. Now, instead of answering these two separate questions of what has happened in the world and what is happening in the world, you can now answer a single and much more important question, what is contextually happening in the world. And why is this contextuality important? Let me take an example. On the screen, what you will see on the left is a mobile location tracking application. You'll see a red arrow, which is the car. On the app, you will see real-time uh, location as well as the speed of the car. This is an event-driven application, and because it uses real-time information, you could possibly build it using some messaging system as long as it could scale. On the right, you see the ETA app by Lyft, one of our largest Confluent Cloud customers. You know, this is a contextual event-driven application because Lyft builds it by combining real-time information with historical data on traffic access patterns. Now, the reason I make this distinction is because there is an entirely different level of value that can be achieved with these contextual event-driven applications. And if you request a ride to the airport, it is certainly valuable to know, you know the location of your driver, but it is much more valuable to know when the driver will actually get to your house. That is the value of a contextual event-driven application. The fact that you can marry real-time data with historical context actually makes all the difference. Now, event streaming isn't just about a foundational technology change, but you have to fundamentally rethink the notion of data itself. The event streaming paradigm rethinks data not as stored records or as transient messages, but as a continually updating stream of information. Essentially, a never-ending stream of events that is both stored and is continually kept updated, giving you both a real-time view of your data, but also full history of how your data has changed over time. Many of you will recognize this as nothing other than the core construct of event streaming, which is the continuous commit log. You know, once used in a company, event streaming gets you this universal event pipeline. This can scale to the scope of an entire organization. It could break infrastructure boundaries. It could break various organization boundaries. But much more importantly, it allows you to build these contextual event-driven applications that could really change how the business works. And all this is powered by Apache Kafka, which acts as the organization's central nervous system. So now that you know about event streaming, I want to transition to how you can succeed with event streaming. And here I want to speak about our cloud journey, you know, things we learned from being one of the largest operators of a fully managed Kafka service. You know, and this sort of um, operational knowledge of running Kafka has had to scale with the growth of data and traffic to our fully managed service. In fact, just today we will be onboarding a new customer who said they would like to do more than 25 gigabytes per second over the next several months. So at this rate, maybe this time next year at the next London summit, this number could be frighteningly about 100 gigabytes per second. You know, the point here is that when this sort of scaling happens in a relatively short amount of time, you end up learning quite a lot, and your systems just have to evolve. 
And so evolving Confluent Cloud over time hasn't been easy. You know, we've encountered a number of obstacles along the way, and what I want to do here is share some of the key lessons that might be helpful to you, you know, as you take this event streaming journey. So the first one is there is no cloud-native easy button. So what I mean by this is becoming cloud-native, if you didn't already start there, it doesn't happen overnight. It is a multi-phase journey. And I like to compare it with traveling. You know, becoming a cloud native could be compared to how can you become a good traveler. You know, what you have to do is you have to learn how to pack smart cloud containers, to learn to speak local languages, Kubernetes, Cloud Foundry, to change your cellular plans, cloud networking, to get local currency, cloud billing. You know, you have to buy maybe a money belt to avoid pickpockets, cloud security. And much more importantly, bring along some of your personal belongings, your data. And that last part, bringing your data, is quite relevant to event streaming. You know, now, if you have to start this cloud-native journey, the first step is building a production-grade application in the cloud. And in order to do that, you have to bring along some of your data so you can start experimenting with that. So, Synchronizing streaming data between on-premises and cloud environments is, as you might know, a pretty good use case for Apache Kafka. So when our customers asked us to solve this problem, initially we thought just about copying data in Kafka, and we thought that would be sufficient. But as we help people do this, we learned quite a few more things that, you know, just copying data in Kafka is not sufficient. You also need to copy schemas that go along with that data. So you can actually evolve that on the fly. The second thing we learned is that people didn't want to just do a blind copy of all their data in the Kafka cluster. They wanted to selectively and securely copy some topics over. That is, wasn't just about moving data in user topics, but in order to migrate consumer applications with minimum manual effort over to the public cloud, we also needed to migrate consumer offsets and so on and so forth. So over time, we added all that functionality to Confluent Replicator. But the point here is that the applicability of this lesson isn't just limited to hybrid environments, but it also extends to multi-cloud environments. And that is really relevant now. You know, a recent survey of over 700 IT executives in the Wall Street Journal noted that over half have either adopted or have plans to adopt hybrid and multi-cloud environments. And the reason people want to do that is because there is a trend to use best-of-class services versus going all in on one public cloud. Right, moving on to schemas. Schemas are the service APIs for event streaming. Now, changing the date field from December 1st, 2015 over to a timestamp can look like a perfectly innocent change. So if all the unit has passed, you can just ship this, right? Well, not too fast. As Uber found in this case and many other companies in other cases, this seemingly innocent change could break multiple downstream consumers that were simply not ready for this format change. So the point here is that just like APIs, schemas of events produced to Kafka are like contracts between the event streaming services. And just like any other API contract, schemas need to be discoverable and searchable, versioned, validated and enforced. Companies that discover this requirement, they turn to the schema registry pattern, a central service that stores all versions of all schemas of data produced to Kafka, allowing users the ability to discover and browse schemas, validate the changes, and then enforce the compatibility of future changes in production. This needs a central schema registry across all your Kafka clusters that you can configure to be both forward and backward compatible. So you can make upstream or downstream changes, or even changes to Kafka itself, without breaking a thing. But the most interesting thing is that having first-class schema discovery, validation, and enforcement, it actually opens the doors to future really exciting use cases. The ability to do broker-side validation, you know, ensure required fields, and maybe even track data lineage. 
Moving on to stream processing. And if I'm being honest, developing stream processing applications can be surprisingly tricky. You know, it is a different way of writing a program. It is a different programming model. And with all that change, you know, sometimes there can be gaps in how you develop your program. You know, for example, when data is in motion in a stream, it can be sometimes be hard to see like, how your application processes all those events. All kinds of problems can occur, from signature mismatches to serialization errors, or maybe just that your processing logic didn't quite do what you expected. Take KSQL, for example, a streaming SQL engine for Apache Kafka. In the past, you might write some queries on you know, Kafka topics, and if the queries didn't quite do what you expected, you might have to scroll through different Kafka log files or attach low-level Kafka consumers to figure out what has happened. As you write hundreds of queries across multiple applications, this can sometimes be pretty untenable. And so we thought hard about what a great observability experience for something like KSQL could look like. No, something that allows you to stay within the same paradigm. We thought, what if you could use the same tools to observe your stream processing program that you used to write it in? Wouldn't that significantly lower the cognitive load of figuring out your problem? So that's how we came up with the KSQL processing log. As KSQL executes a query, it writes records to a processing log that details how it processes every single row including any errors that you encounter along the way. The important thing is that these log entries are structured events. Yes, they have a schema. So you can actually consume and query the processing log using either consumer or KSQL itself. So you, that means you can use the KSQL grammar to actually debug your KSQL queries. And as this example shows, that using this tool, it became much easier to pin down that root cause of all those nulls in your, in your query response back to an upstream serialization error. You know, we knew that scaling our cloud service from 100 megabytes per second to a few gigabytes per second in just a few months was not going to be easy. And this isn't just about sustained growth, but it's about those traffic bursts where you have to allow instantaneous scaling for only a short period of time, followed by downscaling so you don't have to pay for all that unused capacity. And all this meant a serious investment in service elasticity. As we worked on making Kafka elastic in the public cloud, we actually ended up solving a few more problems than we had previously planned. And the first is that elasticity means providing instant access to capacity and also the ability to scale it instantaneously, which pretty much means that there is no time to size or resize clusters when you're experiencing a traffic spike. So we had to get rid of that. The second thing is, you know, when we thought about service elasticity, we only thought about Kafka. But as we worked on making the service elastic, we actually ran into all sorts of limits that the cloud providers rightfully have on their infrastructure. You know, limits on the number of VPC, limits on the number of ELBs. We had to build and rebuild our control plane to work around all those limits in an automated fashion. That took a while. You know, when you design a service that allows for traffic bursts, but also needs to keep several lines of uptime, you also need to balance data in a Kafka cluster not only intelligently, but also in a continuous fashion. And just like our users store data in Confluent Cloud for weeks, sometimes months, the ability to do continuous load balancing also means making sure that you have much less data to move around. As you're experiencing a spike in doing load balancing, you just have to move data out of local storage. So last but not the least, Life is better without cluster sizing. Now, did you know that one of the most frequently asked questions by Kafka operators still is, how many brokers do I really need in my Kafka cluster? And that goes on. How much storage do I need per broker? How do I configure the brokers to actually use all that capacity in the most efficient manner possible? Yes, cluster sizing is a hard problem. You know, it needs a lot of expertise, benchmarking of various kinds of workloads, ongoing capacity planning to make sure that you have enough capacity that you need for your growth. 
At least on premises, you buy machines infrequently, so you have to make some of these choices only once. But in the cloud, you have to keep remaking these choices, you know, keep up with ongoing chains. And all this means, for some of us, getting things wrong and picking between two difficult options. You over-provision or you deal with an outage. And why are you posed with this difficult choice? It's because of several reasons. The first is that sizing in the public cloud is a moving target. You know, you have to make lots and lots of choices between number of instances, cloud options, networking options, uh, number of ELBs, and so on and so forth. By the time you've mastered all those changes, they've released something new. And if you plan to adopt multiple clouds, you can just do the math on the complexity. The second is that understanding cloud infrastructure costs can be surprisingly tricky. And sometimes even the cloud providers document it incorrectly. There have been instances when we had to debug Kafka network pricing in a way that we notified them to update their docs. That was good for the service and for us, but it took multiple days of investigation. And when you self-manage multiple data services in the public cloud, understanding cost attribution of any particular service is even harder. There are so many times when I encounter Kafka operators that incorrectly understand the cost of you know, operations of their own Kafka cluster. So all this you know, means that you know, our observation is that even people who have operated Kafka for years actually find it pretty hard to find the right cloud infrastructure to run it efficiently over time. And, you know, obviously no one loves an outage, so you generously over-provision your Kafka cluster, sometimes massively more than you even need. You know, just this typical example of a Kafka workload, you know, that shows that you have maybe a couple of choices to make between instance sizes and networking options, whether it's VPC peering or private link, or a storage option between, you know, EBS and SSDs, that just the cost of those decisions in the differential can run more than a million per year. Of course, the absolute cost could be much more. So this is a big problem. So those were some of our you know, top lessons learned while co operating Kafka ourselves for years at large scale. You know, for those of you who are self-managing Kafka clusters, be it on premises or in the public cloud, I hope that these lessons help you along your own event streaming journey. And for those of you who prefer to just lean on a fully managed service, Confluent Cloud might be the rest, right place to start. Especially today, I'm really excited to announce a major step forward in making Confluent Cloud an elastic cloud-native event streaming service. You know, cloud today will allow you to elastically scale Kafka workloads from zero to 100 megabytes per second instantaneously and down without ever having to size or provision a cluster. You can scale beyond that to tens of gigabytes per second with a provision capacity model in our enterprise offering. Cloud now allows you to only pay for what you actually stream versus what you think you might use or over-provision peak cluster capacity. You might use the service for a couple days, not use it for a couple months, and not have to pay for all that unused cluster capacity. There are no minimums, and a realistic but small production workload could cost you roughly $50 a month. And uh, what I'm most excited about is that we're also uh, fully managing some several Kafka, popular Kafka tools. Now you can get schemas for free out of the box. You can pipe data from Kafka into S3. You can write KSQL queries over some of your Kafka topics. You know, these features are still in preview, but we're looking for your feedback. So give it a spin and let us know what you think. And here's a quick visual of that simplified experience. As you can notice, you put in the name of a Kafka cluster, you pick a region, you confirm a credit card, and that's about it. Now you can point your clients to a Kafka cluster and start streaming. There is no need to size clusters. There's no need to think of traffic bursts. And we're really stoked about this five seconds to Kafka experience. We hope that you can try it out. If you do choose to try it out, there is Confluent Cloud, but there's also Confluent Platform, which is a self-managed software download. If you choose that option, I'm also happy to announce that all the features, including the commercial ones, are completely free on a single log. 
So before we conclude, I want to pose this question. Just take a moment and think about, you know, what are the possibilities if we could all succeed with event streaming? Every day I get to see event streaming transform the biggest industries out there. You know, for example, event streaming is really disrupting transportation. How many of you remember the days when you had no knowledge of driver arrival, you had no data on uh, sensor diagnostics? Today we have real-time ETA, real-time driver rider matches, real-time sensor diagnostics, all powered by event streaming. Event streaming is transforming banking. How many of you remember the days when you had out of sync account information, banks had to do fraud detection and internal risk reporting in batch. Today we have real-time omni-channel account updates. Banks can do real-time fraud detection and internal risk reporting, all powered by event streaming. How many of you, uh, you know, remember the days when you had out-of-stock emails after placing an online order, you had no real personalization? You know, today, we have real-time inventory across web, mobile, and store, and real-time contextual recommendations. Event streaming is truly transforming every industry out there and will continue to do so in the next few years. But just how big is the impact? You know, 10 years ago, the major cloud vendors you know, shaped the future of the data center by reconceptualizing infrastructure as code. Today, event streaming is reconceptualizing data as a continuous stream of events, making event streaming paradigm truly the future of data. Thank you very much.